those of you that were not here last night, I started talking about taking the limits off God 10 years after, or times 10. In other words, 10 years ago, January the 31st, 2002, the Lord spoke to me through Psalm 78, 41 and said, I had limited him by my small thinking. And that scripture says that in their heart, they turned back and they limited the Holy One of Israel. And I spent quite a bit of time last night. Most people have kind of a fatalistic theology that things just happen and it's fatalistic and there's nothing you can do about it. And that is absolutely untrue. God has a perfect plan for every person's life in here. You know, a scripture that has become pretty popular in the last few years is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I think the NIV says a hope and a future. And God has good thoughts for you. His plans for your life are awesome. He never made a piece of junk. He never made a dud. He never made an average person. Every one of us have something special that God wants to accomplish. But most people are ignorant of this and they have bought into the lie of this world that there's nothing special about them. Every one of you are special. Every one of you are unique. Every one of you can do something that nobody else can do. God has a purpose for your life and most people are limiting what God can do because they just aren't challenging themselves. And so anyway, the Lord spoke this to me 10 years ago and I want to put it into its context. It's not like I wasn't trusting God and seeking God. I was doing more than I had ever done, but still I was comparing myself among other ministers and other ministries and compared to where we came from and stuff we had done well. But the Lord rang my bell and spoke to me that I was limiting him by my small thinking. And when I made that decision to change my life has just revolutionized. Our ministry has transformed. I bet you right now, if I was to ask how many of you have um, been exposed to our ministry since 2002 is when you became aware of our ministry, raise your hand. Did you know if it hadn't have been for the Lord speaking to me and me responding, I wouldn't have been able to touch you. You wouldn't be at this meeting because we were moving along. At that time, we had... Uh, I'm not sure the exact amount. We had started on the INSP network, which covered 3% of the American uh, population. And I had added a number of independent stations, but we were less than 10%, somewhere between 5 and 10% of the U.S. was covered by our television program in 2001. And after I made this decision and started believing God, we now cover 100% of the U.S. market And we have 3.2 billion people around the world that can get our program. And we are ministering into these people's lives because of things that God spoke to me about how I was limiting him. I tell you, that is amazing. That is phenomenal what God has done. And I have seen this work in my life. And so last night I was trying to get across that this isn't just for me. This is for every one of us. God has more for every one of you than what you are experiencing. And I can say that without reservation. I know some of you sitting in this auditorium and I know that you have believed God and good things have happened, but there isn't a person in here that has totally exhausted the ability and the power of God in your life. I believe every one of us is coming short of what God wants us to be. The Lord spoke to me 10 years ago about how I was limiting him. And since then, he's spoken to me other times about I need to start believing bigger again. And uh, you know what? I know that if I continue another 20 years or whatever, the Lord leaves me here. He's going to speak to me again about you got to start believing God and start dreaming bigger. You never outgrow God. You never exhaust everything. Every one of us limits God in some way or another. And so last night I began to talk about Hosea 4, 6. It says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And I honestly didn't know I was limiting God. I thought I was doing good. But when God spoke to me, I began to recognize that I was limiting what God could do through me. And I started changing. And one of the ways that I limited God is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. I used this last night that uh, they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And one of the reasons that people limit God is because we look around 
And we see other people that are struggling. And so we say, well, it's just normal, natural. And so we embrace this. There's people that put up with depression thinking, well, it's just normal. You just have to be depressed. You know, it has now been about, I don't even know, 40 something years since I've been depressed. I don't get depressed. I don't believe in being depressed. Some of you are looking at, you can't do that. That's the reason you're depressed is because you have bought into a lie of the devil. The scripture says in Psalms chapter 16, I believe it's verse 11, that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse five says he will never leave us nor forsake us. So we are always in his presence. He's always with us. The fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22 is love, joy, peace, long suffering, You always have God with you. You always have the fruit of his spirit. You can encourage yourself in the Lord. First Samuel chapter uh, 30, verse four and five. David did that when his men were speaking of stoning him to death and he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. You can rejoice always is what Paul said in Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always and again. I say rejoice. I think one of the reasons he said again, I say rejoice is because he knew people were going to think this is impossible. He must not have meant what he said. So he just said again, I'm saying rejoice. I meant exactly what I said. It is a lie that you have to go through periods of mountaintops and valleys and highs and lows. And religion has embraced this and has actually taught that, oh, it's in the valley where the flowers grow and where the grass grows and this is where you get restored. So these valley experiences are actually good. And they have imputed unto God that God's the one that leads you through these times of depression and hurt and pain and stuff so that you can be a better person. That is not so. Tribulation doesn't make you better. If it did, the people that have been tribulated the most would be the most godly. And that is not true. Now you can learn through the bad experience. I'm not saying you can't learn something from it, but God doesn't put you there. You do not have to live that way. We are supposed to always triumph in our Lord Jesus Christ. Be more than conquerors, above only and not beneath, the head and not the tail. But see, most people compare themselves with even the ungodly. And we look and you hear things about, well, you know, depression and it's just normal and sadness and things like that. I actually saw a bumper sticker that said, if you aren't depressed, you aren't paying attention. (laughs) And you know what? That's a true statement for a non-believer. But if you're a believer, you know, I was thinking with Charlie and Jill were singing this, um, Psalms 91, what was the name of that again? Hiding place or refuge. God is my refuge and strength. And part of that song is a quotation from Psalms 23, where it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And this last year, 2011, I was studying that verse and I just, it just dawned on me. He said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And then I got to thinking about the life of David. David had a lot of problems. David had his son Absalom rise up and start a civil war and tens of thousands of the people in the nation died because of that civil war and his own son was put to death by his general. And then about the last week or month of his life, another son rose up and tried to take over the kingdom and uh, his son Solomon Uh, They came to him and anyway, God turned it around. But I thought, man, this guy had terrible things happen. His wives were, uh, his son Absalom pitched a tent in the middle of Jerusalem and committed adultery with all of his father's wives just to hurt his father and to spite him and to show the people that there was zero chance of David and Absalom being reconciled. Did you know most people would look at that and think, well, goodness and mercy didn't follow him all the days of his life. But they did. And what the Lord spoke to me, he said, I didn't say goodness and mercy is the only thing following you. (laughs) You will have problems, but goodness and mercy are always there. And it just depends on which you're going to focus on. Are you going to focus on the Absalom that tried to kill you and the terrible things? Or are you going to look at the fact that God overcame it? And God kept the kingdom in the hands of David and preserved it. And the people came back to him and he didn't lose his kingdom. 
Are you going to focus on the problems or are you going to focus on the answers? It didn't say goodness and mercy is the only thing that follows you, but goodness and mercy is always there. If you could look at it correctly, it doesn't matter what's happening to you. There is goodness of God right there in that situation to deliver you and protect you. Praise God, things are as good as they are. You know, this is why when we send our students to these foreign countries, third world countries, they come back and many of them, their life is just transformed. You know why? Because all of a sudden they thought they had it tough. And then they realize, man, goodness and mercy has been with us and they weren't aware of it. And they put things into perspective and they get a new outlook on life and realize that our very worst, we are blessed, blessed, blessed beyond any group of people that have ever walked on this earth. We are blessed. Goodness and mercy is always there. So you do not have to just go through bouts of depression and discouragement and be up and down like a yo-yo. The Bible says that Jesus would make the mountains and hills come down and exalt the valleys. If you bring the mountains down and bring the valleys up, that means there ought to be smooth sailing. It shouldn't be like this. That's not the way your life is supposed to go. But I'm saying all of this because we compare ourselves with the world, with people that don't even know God. And if you don't know God, you should be depressed. Life is depressing. Life is terminal. Every one of us is headed towards a grave unless Jesus comes back. And if you only thought about the physical, natural things... There's reasons to be depressed. But if you think about it from God's perspective, man, if you die, you go to be with the Lord. You're going to be in a position where you, the former things will never even come to mind. You are going to be so blessed and you can always look on the positive side. So we need to quit comparing ourselves among ourselves and measuring ourselves by the world. And we need to go to the word of God and find out what God's word says And if you would do that, you would find that God has taken ordinary people, what the world calls ordinary people, and time after time after time after time after time has just transformed their life and then used them to touch other people and change things. There's not a person in here that if you were to adopt this attitude that I'm trying to present, that in 10 years from now, if the Lord tarries that long, your life could be absolutely revolutionized. Your finances could be transformed. Your health could be transformed. Your relationships could be transformed. You could be impacting people for good. You could be in a situation that when people see you coming, they would just, their heart would just rejoice because of all of the great things. And I'm not saying this to hurt, but I'm saying it to help. But there are some of you that when people see you coming, they, they want to go the other way because, oh no. <laughs> They're going to have something else to gripe about. You don't ask them how you are because they'll just tell you what the doctor has said and what this, and they have nothing but just gripes and complaints. There are some of you that that's the way that it is. And it's because you are limiting God. God did not make your life the way that it is. Your life is the way it is because of the thoughts and the things that you've done that limit God. God's will is not coming to pass in your life automatically. He is not the one that has messed your life up. God is a good God. His plans for you are only good. His thoughts are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. But you have to seek him. Those verses right after Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it's, uh, could you put that up there, Lori? It says, uh, 29, verse 12 it says, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It doesn't say these things happen automatically. You have to seek and you have to seek with all of your heart. I've had people before say, well, I've sought the Lord and it didn't work. It always works. If you seek, you find. If you knock, it's open. If you ask, you receive what Matthew chapter seven, verse seven says. And then verse eight says, everyone that asks receives. Everyone that seeks find. But this verse in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13 says you have to seek with all of your heart. And there's a lot of people that seek for a minute or two until their favorite TV show comes on. And if God can absolutely transform your life before your next thing that you want to do comes up, you'll give him five minutes. That's not seeking with all of your heart. But when you put God first, I guarantee you, he will transform your life. 
So we talked, that's what we talked about already. I could preach on all of this again. Look in Mark chapter four. I want to talk about another thing that causes us to limit God. We've talked about basically just ignorance because we're comparing ourselves with other people and we just don't realize the goodness of God and that God wants to do great things. But in Mark chapter four is the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And I won't teach on this whole parable. This is one of the most important parables in the Bible. It transformed my life. But I just want to focus on one thing. The third type of ground that they threw seed on, there was four types of ground, only one out of four brought forth fruit. And even among that, there were some that were 30, some 60, and some 100. The seed had the potential of producing a hundredfold in every case. It wasn't the seed that was the variable. It was the ground that the seed was sown in. And that's symbolic of our heart. And it says right here in Mark chapter four, verse 19, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And this is another way that we limit God is just by distraction, by being occupied with the things of this world. It takes time. Like those other verses, you have to seek the Lord with all of your heart. And you know, most people in America have let the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, it chokes the word. It keeps us from really understanding what God's plans for your life are. One of the things that I've learned is Psalms chapter 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. You know, you cannot really understand the greatness of God without just being still, shutting off some things, being quiet before God and letting God speak. We were in Washington, D.C. the um, week that uh, President Reagan died and they had his procession there and Jamie and I were at that and we went and saw his body in state and things like that. But anyway, as I was walking through Washington, D.C. down the mall, uh, you know, it's a gravel path and I was walking down this path and I just noticed it seemed unusual to me that here I was walking on gravel and I couldn't hear a single sound from those steps. And I remember noticing that. I think I mentioned it to Jamie about, that's amazing that, you know, nobody was around us. It's not like we were having people talk or something, but I couldn't hear any effects of me walking up on that gravel. And then just the next day, we went to the Shenandoah National Park and I walked on the Appalachian Trail and I was walking on gravel there and it was just so loud. It was like it was echoing through the forest, how loud it was. And I was thinking, what is the difference? And the Lord just spoke to me and he says, it's all that ambient noise that's in Washington, D.C., the planes, the traffic. And there was just so much background noise that you couldn't even hear something like somebody just walking on on uh, gravel, but you get into a place where it's out there and it's quiet and it's still, and all, every step I took was just loud. And did you know that there are many of us that the Bible talks about in first uh, Kings chapter 19, that the Lord spoke to Elijah in a still small voice and God he can yell at you. He can do things in a spectacular way to get your attention. But the real nature of God, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. The Lord is actually not prone to just do something to rattle your cage and do this. When Jesus came to the earth, he could have come on a 747 and landed in uh, Jerusalem. That would have attracted people's attention. But instead he came and he announced it to shepherds. And you know, it's because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. God desires for you to respond by faith. He very seldom, he can, and it has happened and it still does happen. But the way that 99% of us are going to relate to the Lord is not through some dramatic thing where a blinding flash of light comes. He's going to reveal himself to you in some subtle simple way that if you aren't careful, you'll let the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter in and it'll just overwhelm. It'll, 
uh, you won't be able to hear that still small voice of God. You got to get still. You got to get quiet. And the American lifestyle is not conducive for a relationship with God. There was a man named Sadhu Sundar Singh. Sadhu is a Indian name for a holy man. So his name is Sundar Singh. And he came to the United States in 1910 because in India, he had meetings where he would see 10 and 12 people a day raised from the dead. He would go into a morgue and empty it. This guy was powerful. And anyway, his fame began to spread. So he had meetings lined up in New York City. This was in 1910. He couldn't fly over here. He had to take a boat. Took a month or more to come over here. And he had like a half a year's worth of meetings set up in the United States. And he got off of the boat in New York City. Walked around New York City for 30 minutes. And got back on the boat. And he said, these people will never listen to God. Their lifestyle won't allow them to. That was in 1910. What do you think he would do with our culture today? I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the way that we just cram our life full of stuff and we never have any downtime and you never... I mean, if you have any downtime, you sit in front of the TV and turn it on. You'd never have a time where your mind is just free to be led by God and go someplace. It limits what God can do in your life. It limits him tremendously. It was a couple of years ago, I had a dream and... In my dream, I just saw like this banner, Psalms 4610. And I've quoted that verse a hundred times, but for the life of me, I could not come up with what Psalms 4610 said. And so when I woke up, I looked it up. And I just felt like God was speaking something to me. So that day, Jamie was gone someplace and it was in the summer. And I went out and I sat in a chair and it says, be still. And know that I am God. I sat in a chair on our deck. We live out in the country, way off from anybody. And I sat there and I didn't know exactly what it meant. Be still and know that I'm God. But I thought, well, just in case I'm going to be still, I'm not going to move. And I, for over an hour, for an hour and a half, I sat and never moved. I didn't do anything. I had deer come up and look at me right in the face. You know, they're nearly, they don't have good eyesight. And if you aren't moving, deer will come up. And I mean, I had a deer come up and just stare me right in the face. I had chipmunks come up and sit on my feet and climb up my leg and stuff. And I looked and did you know that there was just thousands and thousands of ants going everywhere? We probably had 40 or 50 chipmunks just running and doing all of this stuff. I'd sit there and you, it was so quiet. You could hear the birds when they went by. You could hear like that. I mean, and I noticed chipmunk. I heard the wind blowing through the trees. I saw things, noticed things. And you know what I learned through that was? that there is all of this activity going on around us constantly. And yet you get so busy. It had been a long time since I'd sat and heard the wind blow through the trees and paid attention to the birds and the stuff. And there, it was just amazing what was going on around me that I was completely oblivious to because you just get busy and you're thinking about stuff. You know, in the spiritual realm, God is speaking to us constantly. God made you for something great. God is trying to steer your life, but he does not force us. And very seldom will he shout at you. He does things in subtle ways. You know, if I would have been God, after I rose from the dead, I would have hovered over Jerusalem and shown everybody my hands and my feet. I'd have made them bow the knee. Did you know Jesus never appeared to a single person that wasn't already a believer? He never appeared to an unbeliever. He never forced anybody to believe because without faith, it's impossible to please him. God loves it when you just receive it by faith. I was sitting out here yesterday with my granddaughter and she was swimming and I was looking at those palm trees. 
And you know, I was thinking about, you could take all of mankind, you could take the combined resources of the human race, every scientist, all of the national product of the entire human race, and they cannot make a palm tree. They could make something that would look like a palm tree, but it won't be alive. It won't grow. It won't produce another palm tree. And I was looking at those palm trees had grown in the eaves of these buildings. The palm tree grew up to it and then went around the eave and on up. And I thought, even if you could make something that somehow or another would grow, it, how does that piece of wood know to go around that eave? It never touched it. It's like that thing has a brain in it. How do you get these, how do you get these birds? We've been to San Juan Capistrano and birds fly thousands and thousands of miles and come back to the exact same place on the exact same day every year. How do they navigate and do that? How do these fish know where to go and spawn and do all of this? You know, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork, Psalms 19. Day unto day utter his speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language or tongue that their word has not gone forth. It's gone forth into all of the world. Creation is shouting at you every single day. Every sunrise is just a tremendous testimony to the awesomeness of God. Every sunset, the fact that the sun shines, all of these things, it's awesome. God is speaking to us constantly and yet people can drive right through it and never hear it because they got their radio on, they got their TV on, they're thinking about something else. Our lifestyle is choking what God wants to do in our life. You need to spend some time where you're just still and let God speak to you. Most people don't like that because when they get still, you know what happens? It's like there's a homing device on the inside of you. There's a little beeper that every time you get quiet, you'll go to thinking thoughts like, is this all there is? Is this all my life was meant to be? Is there something more? Am I really doing what God called me to do? And most people are uncomfortable with that. And rather than face these hard questions and deal with things, they just turn it off. They occupy themselves. They drown it out. And it keeps you from hearing the voice of God. Amen or oh me. I'm preaching to the choir in a sense because you're the ones that are here at a meeting and you've taken time out of your life to come and put God first. So you are better than the average person. But I can guarantee you that there's people right here in this auditorium that your lifestyle is so busy. Like if you greet one another, how are you doing? One of the typical answers is, man, I'm busier than a one-armed paper hanger. You talk about how busy you are. And it's just normal. I mean, it characterizes our time. And if you have any moments, boy, you fill it with something. You try and multitask. You brag on how you can do multiple things. It's not good. You know what? You need to get to where you live a simple life. You listen to the power of the Holy Spirit. If you don't, those things will limit what God can do in your life. So, uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. Let me turn over and read this verse to you. Boy, this is a powerful passage of scripture that means a lot to me. I quote this a lot. But Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. That is a powerful passage of scripture. God has given you the authority to run your own life. You can do it, but it's the wrong choice. You are only going to reach your full potential if you become God dependent and look to him for leadership because God did not make us to run our own life. The way of man is not in himself. You are supposed to be remote controlled from God. He gave us the choice, 
But he told us in like uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you the choice, but he told you which choice to make. The right choice is to let God be in control. Choose life. And we need to become responsive to God. And you just can't do that when the cares of this life and all of these things are choking the word of God on the inside of us. It takes time. It takes effort. And people will often say, well, I don't have a lot of quantity of time, but I have quality time. That won't get it. It takes quantity of time. You need to keep your mind stayed upon the Lord. This doesn't mean that every person in here needs to become a preacher or go live in a monastery or quit working in the secular world. You can keep your mind stayed on God regardless of what you're doing. You know, I wasn't always a preacher. I went through the army. I got drafted. I was completely submerged, surrounded by ungodliness. And yet I kept my mind on the Lord and put God first and stayed my thinking upon the Lord in the midst of terrible situations. You can do it. I worked secular jobs. I poured concrete for a living and I was able to keep my mind stayed on the Lord. The same part of you that meditates on the things of God is the same part that worries. Worry is nothing but meditation in a negative form. And have you ever been able to go to your job and you're still doing your job and yet you're worried about your family or worried about your finances or your health or you're worrying about something and you worry all day long and yet you still function? Did you know you can also keep your mind stayed upon the Lord? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can bring every thought into captivity and obedience to Christ. You can keep your mind stayed upon the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26 verse three says, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. If you aren't in perfect peace, it's because your mind is not stayed upon the Lord. It's because it's stayed upon this world because we're listening to the same junk that our unbelieving neighbors listen to instead of listening to the word of God. I hope you see a pattern in what I'm saying here. If you are gonna take the limits off of God, you are going to have to diminish the input, the ungodliness and all of the junk of this world that is coming into your heart. And you're going to have to still yourself, quiet yourself and start listening to God and start facing some of these hard questions about, is this all there is to life? Is this all God wants me to do? Is there something else? Am I in the right profession? Is this what God led me to do? And until you start entertaining these thoughts and keep and being still and letting your heart, let God speak to you through your heart. You're going to continue to limit God. As long as you become like your unsaved neighbor over here who is just up to their eyeballs in debt and they're busy and they just are occupied and stuff, you're going to get the same results that they get as long as you do the same things that they do. You need to still yourself and you need to recognize that we, one of the reasons people limit God is because we're so distracted. We're so occupied by the things of this world that the Lord just doesn't have the opportunity to speak to you. Look at this passage over in Acts chapter nine. This is where Saul became Paul. This is his Damascus road experience. And after he encountered the Lord, this bright light blinded him. He had to have people lead him by the hand and he went into Damascus and the Lord appeared unto Ananias and sent Ananias to minister to Saul. And in Acts chapter nine, verse 10, it says, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. 
You know, most of you probably don't have that underlined in your Bible. But that, the Lord rang my bell through this scripture 30 something years ago. Changed my life through this verse. And what he spoke to me, he says, Andrew, how many times have I called your name and you weren't there? You were doing something else. What would have happened if God would have called Ananias and if Ananias was in such a state that the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things was choking the word of God and he hadn't been able to listen. It's possible God would have raised up somebody else to minister to Saul. I'm not sure how it would have played, but we wouldn't be talking about Ananias. And let me just ask you the same question. How many of you... God has spoken to you and tried to keep you from making a mistake and tried to change your life and tried to do things in your life. How many times has he called your name and you weren't there? You were watching As the Stomach Turns on television. (laughs) You were doing something else. You were busy. I'm telling you, our lifestyle that most Americans live is not conducive to knowing God. If you are going to take the limits off of God, you're going to have to start spending time with God. Lots of time with God. You're going to have to start renewing your mind. The word of God is so important because if you aren't careful, your mind will just wander and go to all kinds of weird things. But the word of God will focus your attention. You can study the word and it will And God will speak to you through these things and it focuses your attention on the things of God. But if you're going to take the limits off of God and begin to experience God's best in your life, you are going to have to start unplugging from this world and putting your mind on God and giving God an opportunity to speak in that still small voice. Amen. Most people in here, I'm assuming, desire the results that I'm talking about. But when I start telling you how you get there, there's many of you that are saying, I'm not sure I like this. It becomes addictive. It becomes addictive. You can get addicted not only to drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. You can become addicted to your favorite TV show. You can become addicted to sports. You can become addicted to all kinds of stuff to where, honestly, you just cannot function without that. And you need to make a decision that God is going to be absolute first in your life and you have to spend time with him. You know, I consciously take time off and spend time thinking about the Lord. I I spend time walking on this trail that I've built. I spend time sitting outside and just looking and thinking. It's important. There's a man named Peter Daniels. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but this guy at one time was uh, on the streets, homeless, And anyway, study the lives of famous people. Now he's super rich. He's a multimillionaire and he travels and speaks. And I don't know, gets $100,000, $200,000 for a one hour lecture. And people come to him and he's just a, you know, a real motivational speaker, Christian guy. And anyway, he takes one day a week off and won't have any appointments, doesn't do any business. He takes one day a week to do nothing but think. And the guy's a multi-millionaire and has tremendous ideas that have it put him in a position to where he's influencing many, many people. And he just takes more than one-tenth of his time off thinking. It's important. And yet our lifestyle has just become so busy. That will limit what God can do in your life. For you to be an inspiration to other people, you've got to be inspired yourself. You've got to let God speak to you. You can't give to somebody else what you don't have. And most of us don't have God actively speaking in our life because we just are too busy to give God time. Ananias said, behold, I am here, Lord. And God spoke to me through that and said, I want you to always be there when I want to speak to somebody. I want you to be available. And you know, I don't do this perfectly. None of us do this perfectly. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I'm saying it ought to be our desire that God, we want to know you more. We want to be more available to you. There's no telling how much I've missed, but you know what? I've heard a lot too, just because I was available. 
There are many of you that are so talented that you just depend upon your talent. And you don't feel the need for God as much because you can get things done. You're a motivated person and you are talented and can do all this. I feel sorry for you. It's a blessing not to have any great talent. Because you know what? It makes me dependent upon God. The Bible says God has not chosen the mighty, the rich, the powerful, all of these things, but he chose the weak things of the world and base things of the world and things that are despised and things that are nothing to bring to naught things that are. It's not because God's a lowbrow that he's against people with money or education or talents or ability. It's just that people who have it all in the natural tend to think that they can do it and they don't depend upon God. The reason the vast majority of people that make a difference for God are people that don't have anything going for them is because those people turn to the Lord and are listening and seeking God and God can speak to them. He speaks to the mighty and to the talented and all of these people, but those people don't hear. They don't listen. They aren't as dependent upon God. It's a blessing. It's an asset to know that, man, you need God, that the way of man is not in himself and that you need God. I promise you, if you would spend a few days, if you would take a weekend off and fast and pray and not be distracted by food or anything else and just put your attention on God and say, God, is this all you have for my life? What do you have for me? Am I really where I'm supposed to be? Am I on target? Am I off course? And if you were to give God the total freedom and be still and just let God speak to you, many of you in here would be transformed. Many of you would be just totally, totally transformed by that. But the average person, even the average person here on a Friday morning does not give God that kind of time and that stillness. And we don't listen to the voice of God that much. You need to do this on a regular basis. It says in Proverbs chapter four, the last verse of that chapter, it says, ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. You know what that's talking about? You need to think about the path you're on. You need to ponder it. Think about it. Be still and meditate on it and think, God, am I doing this right? Is this what you want me to do? Is this the way you're wanting me to conduct my life? You need to ponder those things. And if you'll do that, then your path will be established. I spend a lot of time pondering and thinking about what God's done in my life. I spend a lot of time remembering about where I've come from and things that God has spoken to me. You know, I held a meeting right here in Phoenix with Joe Nay, the guy who was my mentor and got me started. And anyway, I could spend a lot of time on this. But we held a meeting here in Phoenix and I invited Joe to come. Joe had gotten out of the ministry. He fell into some sexual sins, had been out of the ministry. God used me to help restore him. And so we held a meeting with Joe Nay and we held it right here in Phoenix. And I was so thrilled because during the day, Joe and I'd drive around, we'd go do things and we'd just visit and reminisce about what God did in 1968 and 69 in our lives. And I was talking about all these things. And finally, Joe, just one day, he says, stop. I don't want to hear any more about it. I said, what's the matter? And he says, I don't remember any of this stuff you're talking about. I was talking about times in his house when we were reading Acts chapter two about a rushing mighty wind. And we had a candle burning and all of a sudden this sound of a rushing mighty wind came so strong and the curtain stood out sideways blowing from this wind and yet that candle never flickered. It was just supernatural. And I mean, it scared me so much. I was 18 years old. I got in my car and ran home and jumped in my bed and put my (laughs) covers over my head. I don't know how I thought that that was going to do anything, but I was talking about that. And I was talking about when he was caught up into heaven and he, he had never, he had been a pagan. He didn't have any Christian background And he says, I was caught up into heaven last night and God spoke to me. And he started describing these animals that he saw. And one had the face of a lion, another the face of an eagle, another a face of a cat. And I turned over to Revelation and showed him. I said, 
Joel, those are the four living creatures that are around the throne. And we read it and it was exactly the way he had described it. Joel forgot all that. He didn't even remember that it had ever happened to him. And you know why? Because he got off track. He let the devil harden his heart in that area. But one of the reasons that I've never gotten off track is because I, I study, I ponder, I remember these things. It amazes me, people that have had God move in their life, but every day they wake up, it's like a brand new day. They aren't sure if they're going to serve the Lord today or not. And it's like they lose their history. God's done so much in my life. I remember this constantly. I always think back every single day to March the 23rd, 1968. I've never gotten over the fact that God touched my life, that he changed me. I remember it constantly. And I bring, I bring 44 years worth of seeking God and walking with God into every single day. And if Satan came and tempted me, man, it's hard for me to get off track because God, look at all the history that we've got. Because I ponder these things. I think about it. And yet so many people, they just have an experience with God and forget it and go on, drown it in their normal lifestyle. And then the next day, it's like none of those things ever happened. I'm telling you, that is that will limit what God can do in your life. For you to have God remove, for you to remove the limits from God and see God's perfect will come to pass in your life. You're going to have to commit yourself to seeking God with all of your heart. To recognizing that you need to be still. Let God speak to you. You need to still your heart. Be quiet before God and listen. I know that that's super simple. Some of you are looking for something more profound. But until you start doing what we're talking about, there's no reason to go on to the next step. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, Satan has just gotten us so busy, so occupied. All of these conveniences that we got that we're going to make our life simpler so we'd have more free time, they just occupy us. The computer's supposed to help you, and yet how many of you have hours and hours a day that you spend on the computer looking at junk? You can use that. There's good purposes for all of these things, but I can guarantee you there's people sitting right here that spend hours a day surfing and just looking and it's the same temptation Adam and Eve had, the knowledge of good and evil. You're just wondering what's out there. You got to know all of these things and it's hardening your heart towards God. It makes you insensitive towards God, dull and unperceptive. We need to be focused on the Lord. You need to spend time. You need to calm yourself. And I'm promising you, if you don't do that, you will limit what God can do in your life. He will not force you. He will not take you and ground you into the dirt and just force you to do things. He will draw you and woo you and he'll speak to you in a still small voice. And if you are, if you have so much noise going on around you, you won't hear his voice. And then you'll wonder why God isn't speaking to you. John chapter 10 says, my sheep hear my voice. It didn't say my sheep can hear my voice. It says my sheep do hear my voice. God is speaking to you every minute of every day. Every time you have a choice, God is giving you direction. If you aren't hearing it, it's because you're dull of hearing, not because God isn't speaking. It's because you are drowning it out with all of the other things. And you're going to have to change your lifestyle and your focus in order to take the limits off of God. That's a good word. And again, this isn't popular because, man, the American lifestyle is indulging your flesh. You know, when I was a kid, we had three channels. ABC, NBC, and CBS. And there just wasn't a lot on there outside of howdy doody or something. It was just no good. Nowadays, you've got hundreds of channels. And if that isn't enough, you can get on Netflix and have hundreds of movies and you can do this and DVDs and then you can get on the internet. And you know what? You can just literally fill your life so full that there is no room for God. 
and it indulges all of your senses. And you know what? It'll choke the word of God. Scripture says, I believe it's Romans 16, 19. I would have you to be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. And the word simple there is the word we get simpleton from are stupid. The Lord literally would have us not to know all of this stuff that is going on in the world. And yet the average Christian is well versed in all of the ungodliness. And we somehow or another think it's, it's wisdom to just learn all we can about all this stuff. God would have us to be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. He wants you to be just literally stupid when it comes to evil and ungodliness, and yet most of us are well-versed. Amen. I had some other things I was going to share, but I think that that's what God wanted to get across this morning. If you come back tonight, I'm going to start talking about some of the major things in my life that kept me from, uh, that made me limit God even unintentionally. And I tell you, I think that this is going to make a difference. But I just want to say, Paul said this, he says, uh, talking about the Thessalonians, he says, you received it, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And I really believe that this is God speaking through me today. I believe that this was a word from God for this group, for the people that'll be watching by television. I believe that God is speaking to you. So I believe that this is tailor-made for this group and I encourage you not to receive it just as the word of Andrew Womack, but to receive it as it is in truth, the word of God speaking to you. And if you would act on it and implement this and not just do it one time, but make a lifestyle of just being more sensitive to the Lord, listening to the Lord, turning off something and turning on the Lord, turning on the word. If you would do that, your life would transform. I believe that every one of us is living below our privileges and God has more for every one of us in what we're experiencing. And one of the ways that we're going to start experiencing it is to start just tuning in and showing up and saying, behold, I am here, Lord. Speak for your servant hears. That's what Samuel said. And you just need to make yourself available. If you'll do that, I guarantee you God's got more for you than what you've experienced. And I believe he'll give you some supernatural direction. Amen. Amen. Father, I just pray over this word and I pray for every person that's here. And I ask the Holy Spirit to make these things become real in their life. Give them specific application of how to put this to practice in their life. Thank you, Father. Father, I believe that you are speaking to people right now and showing them things. Father, I believe that people will make commitments that they are going to spend some time, that they'll fast something, even if it's not food, that they'll fast a show or they'll fast some time or do something and just spend some time separated unto you listening. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that people will respond. And because of this, you'll be able to speak to people and that they'll hear that still small voice and that miraculous things will happen. Thank you, Jesus. We agree and receive that in the name of the Lord. Amen.